What up, Whiskey Ginger fans? Welcome back to the show. If it's your first time joining the show, welcome to the show. We got a good one for you today. Like my man Steve Harvey done say, it's Dane Cook. Dane Cook, been in the game for a, a long, long time. Started the internet revolution of comedy many moons ago on MySpace, and he's here with us today. Uh, I'm on tour, baby. Me and Bob Lee are touring around the country in the fall. Come see Bad Friends Live. We do stand-up. We do bits from the show. You can get involved as an audience member. It's so much fun. Uh, We're going to be going to uh, Boston, then D.C. We're going to be in Denver, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Madison, Milwaukee. A lot of M's in there, baby. A lot of M's. Uh, come out and see us. Go to badfriendspod.com. Badfriendspod.com for those tickets. Enough rambling from me. Let's go to the episode. In here, we pour whiskey, 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 whiskey. Oh, that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me $5 for the whiskey and $75 for the horse. Gingers are oh, hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers. All right, are we rolling on all of them? <laughs> Coney, make sure. McCone is a good kid, but he's 22, so sometimes he's the dumbest guy on earth. Okay. Because he's filled with jizz. That's the problem. Is he? Does he? Uh, is he one of those guys that you can you can read the room and see that the face that he's making something's wrong, and you have to then go, I'm sorry, should we stop? Is something up? It feels like. No. Here's the issue. His face is always contorted. And he does this thing. He, He's wearing me right now. Yeah, see, 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 who it's that, scary. This nod? He's scary, dude. I don't know what it is, but it's a Minnesota thing. They're all a little evasive and strange, and yeah. they don't mean, they didn't mean they no They all hold harm. their knee like that, too. They're knee holders. They always fucking do the thing where they They're hold their knee They're always holding in. their knee. They're ready yeah. to do a, a, a jackknife in a pool at any yeah. given time. I feel like I'm at an al meeting with this dude right now, right? <laughs> He's just fucking waiting to speak. But he's not sure if he's ready to fucking he won't share, share the goods. All he right. won't share. Okay. Wait, have you been to Al-Anon? Yeah. You're a big Al-Anon oh, guy. Oh, dude, I grew up going to Al-Anon meetings. I didn't even know what I was going to. My mom, my mom would take me to, like, the local Hyatt Regency or whatever it was where they were That's having, like, were a at. little... And, and we would uh, go there and fucking, I'd just be sitting there like, oh, what is this exactly? Yeah. I, you know, I was like, this is the worst comedy show that my mom could have. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are all bombing. My dad, I got, I went to one with, my dad was, uh, my dad liked prison and cocaine. Okay. So he went a bunch. He kept yeah. going back to prison. He did? So, yeah, dude, he was good at it. Oh, he, shit. One of the best. Okay. Maybe one of the best. <laughs> but he kept, he got in and out a few times, got clean. And when I was, mm, I want to say in my young teens, he took me to my first yeah, I was Al-Anon. like 13. Yeah, and it was 13 like Al-Anon. eye-opening. The amount of cigarettes and coffee consumed was like Yeah, the stunning. amount of like, uh, it was almost like commandments, but not. It was like, right. here's the 11 things that are, you, you know, you must have to. And it's weird because some of them I adopted and I know are still a part of my life, but I don't remember the uh, the exact um, rigmarole that you were supposed yeah. to like go one one at a time through. But we used to we used to hit one a week, man. I used to go with my mom all the time because my dad drank. Yeah. And uh, probably should have been in prison, actually, a couple of times. That might have given us a little bit of a fucking intermission. Yeah, but a little time out for yeah, that. Yeah, no, instead nice. it was, like, local cops coming to the house that were his boys anyway and saying mm-hmm. things like, you know, Georgie, we got come on, let's we got to get out of here. And then they probably all go drink together. Sure, um, of course. So I'm glad that we uh, have similar uh, Al-Anon upbringing. Well, yeah, my, mine was never, booze was never my dad's vice, which is uh, uh, ironic because I love booze, but I don't really like anything else. Like, I never... What about prison? Prison is chill. When you drive by a prison, are you like, mm. uh, Papa? <laughs> I've run into <laughs> my father when I go past Cook County. No, you know what's so funny is he, I just, I learned at a young age that you're like, when you heard prisoner jail, I always thought murderer, you know, like the worst kind of people. And then right. you're like, man, there's a lot of people in there for a lot of different things. And my yeah, dad yeah. became one of those things where I was like, he was never a bad person. He made some mistakes in life with choices. And it reframed my mindset about who goes to jail and prison. It, I was like, oh, it's not – as a kid, you're like, that's where the worst people on earth are. Yeah, it, but it was also glamorized because I grew up watching, right. like, you wanted to go to prison because then you could escape and make good friends <laughs> right, and, like, right, build a boat right, together. Right. And you get to dig and fucking learn what kind of uh, minerals the wall's made right. out of. And it just seemed like kind of a, a crafty kind of place. Yeah, Dane crawled through 400 <laughs> yards of foul-smelling shit I can't imagine. <laughs> Only to come out clean come on, on the, the other, other side. side. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> oh, it's still the best. And also, when he was doing that, when he was, like, army crawling through that pipe, yeah, every piece of me thought, what if somebody flushes? <laughs> What if, 
I was always like, what if there's no way there's not another pipe that isn't connected to So you're telling me all night nobody flushed, there was no poop coming down? I think once a week, for whatever reason, I just hear the the name Andy Dufresne. Andy Dufresne. It just goes through my fucking head. I know. Is that in your top five favorite films of 100%. all time? 100%. Yeah, right the only reason it's been pulled away is because it's Let's been overplayed. Yep. Put your knee up again when we he asks. We should just grab the knee, and that'll that's an indicator is, that yeah, like we're all cool. safe here. It's got to be one of my top fives, but I will say this. It got overplayed so much on the movie channel right. that I got a little grossed out by how often I'd see it. But my phrase that sticks in my head is, uh, I just miss my friend. I guess I miss my friend. Right. I think about that all the time. When I think about friends from back home, I go, I guess I just miss my friend. Right. I do. I do miss my friends from home. Do you miss guys from back home? Yeah, and I wish that they would leave me a letter and tell me there's a fucking onyx stone somewhere <laughs> under a giant enormous right. tree that looks like no other trees in the forest. That's right. And you can and that's where you can you made love for the first time, didn't you? <laughs> that's actually true. Yeah. That's a good segue into the love. Wait, where did you where did you lose your virginity? Now um, I'm curious. On my high school girlfriend's front porch. A on porch? My seven, uh, I was 16. It was on my 17th birthday. So it was the night of my birthday. She crawled into my sleeping bag and it was a, a screen, East Coast screened in porch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Families in the house, they're all in their bedroom and, you know, then she, you know, sneaks into the, uh, the sleeping bag and at that point I was like, oh shit, this is like happening right now. Yeah. That was it. So I was either 16 or minutes away from being 17. Did you zip it up? The the bag yeah the, uh, I don't remember like when you crawl in did she did she I think, did you open and then close it I think when she crawled in oh this is gonna sound so corny but the thing that I remember for whatever reason is I shouldn't even say this say is it. so corny I remember well first of all I remember I was like fucking you know I was like laser hard yeah but it hurts I, doesn't it when yeah it's that, it really when it's was it was almost like I I, I really felt like uh, my whole body just like <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm ready for this moment and then I looked through the screen door. And the moon was full. And I remember thinking, like, I'm a man now. <laughs> it's like the cheesiest. No, I no. It was like cute. I was in the moment yeah. looking up at the full moon and realizing, okay, I'm about to, you know, I'm going to have a deep voice tomorrow. <laughs> my balls are going to drop. When I was on the beach, uh, this that's not corny. When I was on the beach losing my virginity, I've talked about it on another show. I was 17. Okay. 17. And uh, we were on the beach, and we were. she was sitting on my lap, um, and we were looking up at the stars over the beach. And she said she wanted to see a shooting star <laughs> before we hooked up. Yeah. And you're waiting for, you know, an hour, two hours. And then I remember just pretending that I saw one. <laughs> Being like, oh. You just sold her on it. <laughs> oh. And she was like, is that? I was like, it was. It had, that had to, did you see it? Because because you know how, like, if you're a little buzzed or if it's late at night and you're, like, dreary, if you, like, look and look back at something, it Everything feels moves. like mo Yeah. And yeah. you're like, was that? Shooting refrigerator if you fucking whip snap your neck. Yeah, if you quick snap enough. it hard enough. <laughs> that's what I, I think I got. I think that was the way that. I was like, okay, let's finally do it. She was like waiting for the right moment or something. Are you real? I don't know why I'm jumping back. Yeah, give it. Uh, uh, are you a sci fi fan? Do you watch Andor? Have you no, watched No, I've Andor? never seen Andor. Should I see Andor? You should see Andor because not only it, it doesn't matter. If you're not like into Star Wars or sci fi, it's. I like Star it's Wars. It's not. It's set in the Star Wars universe, but if you didn't know, if I didn't tell you, you'd be like, oh, oh, this is Star Wars? Yeah. There's no aliens, no Jedi, none of that. But the reason I'm telling you is because there's a three episode arc which is basically as good as Shawshank, but in space. There's a space jail, and what happens with our characters? Uh -huh. I think you would appreciate it. You probably text me and be like, "This is this is Shawshank Star Wars." Okay, right send here. me, remind me so I can text me after the show because I want I'll watch it's, it. It's really good. I want to see this. Anyway, you'll remove that from the final cut because <laughs> nobody gives a fuck about. <laughs> no, hold on, wait. <laughs> my jump, fun fact. Jump reminders. back because I'm interested now. Yeah. I just said. Uh, when we talked about Al Anon and stuff, you've never you've never come near the sauce. True. And it's a, this is obviously a sauce based show, and not everyone that comes on the show drinks. A lot of my friends are sober, but a lot of my friends found sobriety through struggle. Okay. You never wanted to go near it. I didn't drink. Yeah, no. ever. And it has, and, and and you probably will die never having a, a taste of it. I can't say that. Really? I can't say that only because I never. I didn't make a pact with myself to never drink. Uh, it was just something that when I hit 20, I felt like it was it was like, um, okay, everybody I know is sozzled 24-7. Yeah. And competing with it and trying to out-fucking inebriate each other. And so I looked at it at the beginning like, let me just see if it's something that to perform and stuff I would, I would need. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I was like 22 or 23 that I, I kind of was like, all right, I'm doing pretty well. What if I fuck up? What if I am fucked up? Uh, and what if I got the gene? 
which a lot of the people that I knew had it. And so I waited. And then when I hit 30, it became kind of like a thing where people were like, oh, you don't drink. You don't drink. That's like your shtick. That's mm -hmm. your thing. But I can't say that I would never drink because I'm not anti drugs or alcohol. Yeah, but it's not your, but it's just one of those things. I feel like if you've gone this far, yeah, it's like with me and heroin. I'm probably not that. gonna do it. <laughs> That's the one you have done. <laughs> well, since I was nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's getting no. laced. No, I, I, I think. No, but I'm probably not gonna do it. I'm probably not gonna. I like cocaine. I'm probably never gonna do it. I've always. My dad did it. But I like mind altering stuff. And when I hear stories and I watch podcasts and people talk about, uh, can you make a little bit more noise with the keys? Yeah, please. If you could, please yeah. just jingle, jangle wait till he those starts, a little wait, bit. Wait, wait till McCone starts going through. Um, they'll start typing in the middle of the fucking. We were. Uh, Steven Soderbergh was on. Yeah. And the kid is like ticky tack typing yeah. in the background. Dude, we hear. Everything, Everything is comedians. We hear what the waitress whispered about the order that they said was wrong, but the customer was wrong, mm -hmm. and the waitress knew that they had it right the first time. We're dialed into every single. I just heard your fucking bone settle. <laughs> I just heard your fucking bone settle, man. You gotta he's, get that. You gotta get that patella tendon checked out, okay? Well, he's got so much cartilage. You got a microscopic fucking hole in there, man. It might but need I to be filled him, with your own plasma. He's got those shoes. Those are bad walking shoes. I say that all the time, dude. We got to get you some more support. You're gonna end up like me. I'm on drugs right now. Are those Dana Reeboks? Line. Drugs. Wow, man, those are fucking throwback Thursday sneakers. Old school. Yeah. There's no tread on those at all. No. Nothing. Look at that, dude. Look <laughs> at the bottom of his fucking. He could enter a slap fight, and if the guy closed his eyes, he would think it was a hand, but it was the bottom of his fucking of that fucking. Have you kit. seen that, by the way? The slap fight championships yeah. online. Yeah. I, I kind of want to. I want to go to a live one. I, I want to see it, but I'm always like, dude, if if you're just a little off, aren't you losing teeth in the well, back? Well, essentially, have you seen they? They're so technical about it, what's a what's a slap or what's an illegal hit. Yeah, because they kind of do this, right? Yeah, you have to be on an axis, right. and you have to only you can only do it one, two, and on the third you have to slap. Yeah, right. You can't do it out of turn. But I've seen a few guys that get so far back it hits the ear. Have you seen this? It's disgusting, and the ear will start bleeding, and oh, then you'll fuck. see like their jaw looks like it's disc like unhinged. Right. Like they're in, in their face sometimes will immediately like <laughs> yeah, right? you could see it blow up like yeah. almost like right away when they get hit. I don't like the guys. I, I I don't trust the guys that I see come out of the fight but don't look like they got into a fight. That scares me the most. Like at, like UFC, it, like um, Sugar Sean, right? He just had Sean O'Malley. He just had a fight and yep. then. Afterwards, it looks like nothing happened. Right. That scares me the most. Yeah. I feel like you should look all fucked up. If your face can take all these hits and nothing changes. Yeah. You've only won if you look like Rocky. Right. Yeah. You, you want you to. Yep, somebody's got to cut your eyes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> was that a big film for you as a kid, Rocky? Uh, yeah. 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 Like, I think movie movies probably had as much an impact on me as, as comedy. Like, I love stand up, but I think. Um, Certain performances, like also, like fucking Willy Wonka, like Gene Wilder in that movie, like yeah. it was the idea of like being funny, but then being something else. The the the, the king of comedy, mm. you know. I I like Jerry Lewis in his later years became my mentor, and for about six years, every Sunday, I would my call with Jerry. It was like I should do a book called my my call with Jerry. You should, and we would talk about fucking king of comedy, and I, I told him I was like. That's the movie that almost immediately when I started stand up, I was like, I'm, I'm a nobody, but I'm already fighting the idea of like, I don't want to just be funny. I want to be able to play a fucking part like that. That's kind of like, you know, twisted and a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, you know, an offshoot of the character or whatever people see you as. So Rocky, I think Rocky, because it, honestly, it was like that. It was so emotional that movie. The scenes with the turtle and uh, yeah. you know Adrian yeah. in the in the pet store. It so, was really sweet. Yeah, it was it was great. And, but he was funny. So anything that was like attached, to like oh he's funny, that mm -hmm. he makes me laugh. He kind of escapes me from this. You know, sometimes our house was a little turbulent. So anything that was comedy, but also something that was uh, somebody who wanted to get out of a situation, <laughs> that kind of showed me like a little bit of like where I was at growing up. In, uh, in Arlington, like, what's the escape? Willy Wonka, like, what's the fucking golden ticket? What's my thing out of here? What's the way out? Right? So, yeah, I love performance in general. Did you get, did, were you, when I, you don't have to t touch too deep, but when you say you wanted an escape, was the house so toxic when you were a kid uh, that you were, like, scared for your life type shit? There was some pretty gnarly stuff in there, man. Yeah, yeah. my mom and dad got into some barn burners. They got yeah. it, like, there were some nights where it was, it was, so loud that they had to shut all the windows and like prepare for like whatever the next level of, you know, screaming and shouting was. Yeah. And they were competitive. So every, everybody wanted to win, even if it was an argument. Uh -huh. Nobody was just like, ah, whatever. Nobody walked away from anything in my house. We it never like, ended. This is it. You know, yeah. we're going until somebody's like, I'm just fucking tired. Um, so I think that 
everything for me in terms of the the way we grew the way we grew up years later in my therapy it was like we were on such a tilt that I didn't I thought it was normal yeah. but we were always kind of in a place where we didn't really know level ground you know yeah what so, is normal yeah no no I didn't know normal till I I had a home and then finally I was like Oh, this is boring. Nobody's yelling right now. Yeah, fuck. Like, I have to yell once in a while just to keep things interesting. <laughs> I just, enter I just your look house. in the mirror. I'm like, you're fucked up! <laughs> and just to see if I can incite some fucking anger. Um, but no, I'm, I, I learned through the years, like, I'm uh, away from stand-up, very passive, very, yeah. like, I like it, very zen, low-key. And so, yeah, it took a lot of years, but inspired by a lot of different films and, and stand-up. Yeah, and you, look, your, your reign in, I've known you for probably... I don't know, 12 years or more, something and, around and, that. And I know you too, and you know what's interesting, and maybe this is too much information, but like, you're one of the guys that like, we know each other, but we don't really know each yeah, other. Yeah, of course, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and that, and I'm not saying that in a bad way, like, I, I've always admired the work that you've put in, and you're, you know, you've fucking done some cool shit, man, in your yeah. career, acting-wise, and all that, but it's still like, whatever circles we ran in, it was always kind of like, yeah, hey, what's up, yeah, man? Yeah, and what's like, up, what's you know, up? seeing each other, yeah. and then whatever, we're both well, off you to were, whatever you we're were doing. At the, you were at a height you were at another height period when I first started. And you were nobody. Yeah, that's right. I was at the bottom. You were nothing. Yeah, 22. And look at me now. I'd see you at the end of a fucking alleyway, just sitting in with the one leg. <laughs> and no, you, no, you were coming up no, the No, but ranks, the hustle. Man. But I was hustling hard, and the Laugh Factory yeah. was... Jamie was always very nice to me, even when I was very young, for no other reason than I think he thought I was good. And that, and you were... you. That was kind of like a, a home for you, your second home. Like oh, You totally. were there... As much as I could remember constantly, every yeah. single night. That that club pretty much changed my career. Yeah. Because if I didn't get in there, I came out in 98, uh, and I was here for what I thought was a couple of months on my buddy Wayne Previty's futon, um, who sadly just passed away. Uh, but he was, the, he was the guy who who really, he his futon gave me the opportunity to stay here, and then Masada put me up, and I realized around 98, like, um, you know, Shirley Hemphill's out here and Paul Rodriguez and all these funny people that are kind of like aging out in terms of they came up with their generation. They were locked sure. in. Everybody knew them and they're like legendary. But there was really nobody young. If I went back east, everybody was in the pits trying to figure out how to yeah. figure out New York and Boston. So I just ended up staying out here because Jamie offered me the opportunity to get on stage. He was like, you can go up as much as you want. He did. Yeah, he was like, he was like, uh, you know, buddy, any buddy, night you want to come. Buddy. Yeah, buddy, come in any night. You get up. You know, you work. You work your thing. Um, <laughs> and so I just, honestly, I just took him up on that and figured, you know, if he's going to give me the stage time and I'm, you know, I'm on Sunset Boulevard. It's yeah. like, you know, you're, it's glamorous and you're like, wow, prior out here. And it just, it was, everything was the store and Kinnison and all the stories. You, you almost, it sounds kind of. Like, you couldn't believe you're so close to it. I'm sure you felt that when you first 100%. were. Like, I can't believe I'm I, I'm sharing stages where, you know, this is where every hero I ever wanted to emulate has performed in here. Yeah. Uh, how long will I be invited to the dance and can I get better? But I, I loved that period of time when I didn't know. Yeah. How do you feel the dance is now? The uh, the scene? Like, you for you, you're saying, do I get invited to the dance? And now you've been at the dance for a long time. Oh, what yeah. What is it like now for you? Yeah, now it's like, now I'm the old bull in the hill that... I feel like the the personal dance and goals for me, um, I, I'm always enthused about. I always get excited about whatever it is that I'm working on next. I get more excited that I now get to be a mirror for some other people that sometimes want to come to me and get my two cents, almost sure. like being a mentor to other people, but in the way that I wish I had more of, which is I had a lot of people that were frustrated that I was finding a path, and I had a lot of people trying to give me the wrong advice. You shouldn't do, you shouldn't. I was hearing a lot of that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do, you shouldn't perform there. Whereas I was uh, fortunate enough to start uh, realizing my whole thing is like helping somebody keep their integrity and what your act is has nothing to do with me, mm. but the legal stuff, the, you know, people trying to change you from what you are, like be whatever the fuck you are. You have to make your own mistakes. You have to you know, if if I didn't ignore some of those things and I took the advice of a lot of the people that told me I should, should, should do this, this, I, I never would have had the career that I had. In here, we pour whiskey. whiskey. This episode of Whiskey Ginger is brought to you by Rabbit Hole. I've been talking about this sauce for quite a long time now. 
introducing Rabbit Hole and their one-of-a-kind bourbon and rye whiskeys. Uh, Kaveh Zamanian, Rabbit Hole's founder and whiskey maker, gave up a 25-plus year career as a clinical psychologist to pursue his lifelong passion to craft the world's finest spirits, and that he did. All right? He didn't want to buy aged whiskey. Uh-uh. He went all in, learning from the best. He wanted to develop his own recipes, an iconic bourbon distillery in Louisville, Kentucky, where them horses be running, baby. He made some great sauce right now. Grab some of this jazz. I, I, I really do love it. Um, there's four different expressions. I love the way it feels in your hand, too. The bottle is great. It's, it's beautiful, and it tastes really good. The sauce inside is just as good as the bottle on the outside. Their mission is to transform the ordinary into the extraordinary, and their whiskeys prove it. Original mash bill recipe, signature malted grains, aged and hand-selected chart, and toasted barrels. They do both. Uh, Award-winning small batch whiskey made with passion and love. So if you're looking for a whiskey with a new perspective, huh? skip the ordinary, sip the extraordinary. That's rabbit hole. Uh, this right here that I held up, that's their high gold. This stuff is real good. Award-winning high rye double malt bourbon. Yum, yum, yum. Um, they've also got the Cave Hill. That's old school. They're award-winning four-grain triple malt bourbon. This is the OG stuff. And, of course, if you're a rye guy or gal, go ahead and get this Boxer Grail. And to top it off, uh, they've got the Derringer. The Derringer, uh, a lot of people that come on the show love this stuff because uh, it's aged in uh, Pedro Jimenez uh, sherry casks. It's a little bit of sweet, a little bit of sweet in notes. So uh, go grab yourself a bottle. Go to rabbitholedistillery.com slash drizzly. Use the promo code rabbit for $5 off your first order. Or go to rabbitholedistillery.com. Find a bottle in your area. They're sold all over the place. Drink responsibly. Have fun. Ginger. I like gingers. And, so. you, and where you are now, though, are you, what's, like, what's the thing for you that's, like, now that you've accomplished, stand-up is kind of one of those things where a lot of guys, once they conquer the final boss, so to speak, which you did in many ways. Right. Had, you have all, you've done all the things that a stand-up could really do. It's now, it's like, do you want to continue to do stand-up just because you love it so love fucking it. much? Or are you also trying to make a new version of yourself in stand-up? Right. Well, I think that it's always a new version because loving Carlin or Pryor, you realize, oh, these are chapters from a, a journal. Yeah. This is also, if you stick around long enough, you actually get to comment and do commentary on yourself, your own ignorance, your, you know, yeah. uh, self-deprecating. Uh, the new special I just put out, Above It All, and then I'm editing um, the second night. We did two nights, two shows. The second night, even more so about, like, taking the piss out of myself and talking about some of the things that I fucked up on the way up and some of the things that uh, I actually did right and what humorous came out of both of those yeah. situations. So once you have the luxury of feeling like you've cemented a moment and then that moment ends or it becomes something else, the pressure is off. Yeah. So it's now like, all right, where do I want to take it? What do I truly want to be talking about? And then uh, for me, uh, away from stand-up, how do I want to use that same energy that I have for 32 years to get to where I got? I still have that same energy. I wake up with the same feeling as 1992 where I'm like, the first thing I'm thinking of is like, what's on the agenda? What do I want to mm -hmm. do? What am I you know, shooting for next? Who said no? How can I turn that into a yes but to know that now I can do that and go like, okay, the pressure's off. I'm not trying to like pull ahead of the pack. I can just try to figure out what, how do I really want to, what frequency do I want to dial into here? And what do I want to, what am I ready to share? Well, you know? Well, when yeah. you said, I don't want you to give anything away, but it's interesting when you said like some of the things you did really right and some of the things you did really wrong. Do you, like, what was one thing that you were like, I fucked that, I can't believe I fucked that piece up. And um, that doesn't stick with you and certain, not like regret, but like. It's probably more that the the worst part about breaking away from the graduating class that I came up with and being kind of first mm -hmm. was there's no playbook for that. I'm a welfare kid out of Arlington, Massachusetts. Uh, I didn't have a mentor who was successful at that at that time to really be like, welcome in. Here's kind of how you sure. you know here's the decorum. Here's right. how you behave. So. It was a mixture for me probably of the ego hits you first, but then you realize, oh, all my ego is is a veil for the insecurity that I still feel from when I was a kid, which I had a lot. I don't want to go so – it's too yeah, – it's, it's yeah. too modeling. Yeah. But I, I was really upside down. And for a lot of years, I thought stand-up made me this person that would then bleed into the rest of my life. But when I would leave the stage, I was still that kid. Yeah. So – Ego coupled with a lot of abandonment. And I wish the biggest mistake that I made was not going to some of the guys that even that I came up with to say, I know you feel like you don't know how to hang with me right now because a lot of it was them too being like, I, 
you're doing this cool shit and I feel like I'm not really doing anything. And of course, I'm like, I don't want you to feel that way. I want us to all enjoy. Yeah. To, I did Torgasm to go. I had people say, you can do that on your own. I'm like, I want to no, know. Let me share it. Let me see if these guys can pop off this moment as well. And they did. A lot of guys did. Yeah. For, yeah. You know, B- uh, Bobby Kelly yeah. and Gary Goldman. Jay yeah. Davis was in there. And it's like, um, but I wish I had taken more advantage and been more honest, even with the guys that I came up with to say, I kind of feel like I'm losing myself a little bit. And then by the time I got to the pinnacle, you know, my, my mom and dad are sick. I'm fucking fighting cancer with them, but I'm also the biggest comedian in the world. And so every day I step off stage and I go right home to like try to, you know, I'm talking, I'm, I'm dealing with hospice <laughs> as the crowd is fucking still rifling out of arena number 180. I was just with Al Dotley, my old tour manager. We, 181 arenas you know, over a two year period. Fuck. A arenas, B arenas, fucking shitty C arenas, like arenas that like shouldn't have even been in. We did Hassan Hussein's fucking arena <laughs> over in Iraq, legit. Like we're fucking, you name a spot in the world, we went there. Did you bomb? But uh, no, I fucking, I, <laughs> <laughs> I killed, no bomb. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, it was, that was, uh, that was probably the thing that took the most time to resolve, I guess, yeah. was that I had apologies to make to some people because. I too pulled away from certain people because I didn't know how to say help, yeah. you know? Cause how do you say help when everybody thinks you're the shit, right? You're the fucking lead dog in a moment. And you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? And the industry is pulling you along and it's like fucking throwing you the fucking a little yeah. bit of cash and a little bit of love. And you, you, all you want is for somebody to come in and go, okay, here's the reality of it. You're, you're in your moment. Moment can last eight months. For me, it lasted about eight years. It was a good eight-year run from whatever, 2002 to the end of the decade. Yeah. And I look back and go, man, I wish that I could have locked in with a couple of people, I won't say who in particular, that it took me a long time to finally um, mend those relationships. I think we missed out on some time. That could have been pretty cool. But I think that's super big of you to say, genuinely, I mean this, when you said, uh, I wish I could have admitted that I'm losing myself a little bit. That's a thing that I think nobody really talks about. Like, Yeah, and that's I, part I, of what I, when I mentor, yeah, I, I'm always saying like, have a clear boundary of where the industry is over here. And when you go home, that's just life. Right. You're just a normal fucking human being. I know that the calls and the, everything permeates, but try as soon as you can to just confess and profess that you don't have it together. I know you look like you do. I do. I know people right now that are in that moment. You know people right now that are in that moment. Those are the people I call and yeah. go. I know you're spinning. I get it, but take time to step away and like tell the people that you want to love. Spend the time with the people. And if you're fucked up, don't wait. Call somebody and be like, I don't. I really don't know what I'm doing because yeah. we get it. There's more people that are like, I know. Yeah, me well, too. Well, because most people are going through something. It's hard to explain. It's hard for people outside of the business to for you to explain to them like, hey, man, this is kind of a hard, weird thing when. You're getting success and the business is here and your new friends are kind of this, this, you know, these people that you're like, God, these guys like me because they like me or because right. I, so all of these things, no one really takes into account when you're on your rise. And when, I, when you see that f- as someone who's grown with guys who have exploded, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's tougher than people think in a way that's like, I know at home, it's oh, cry me a river, yeah. you know, world's smallest violin, but it is a challenge in a way that is no human's most humans don't experience. Right. The, the, the world doesn't un, can't experience that because it's so uniquely But what's odd. so great is when you see people or you know people and they have their moment. Yeah. And even better is when they can call you and go, I've had some people call me over the years and go, I, I, I get it. I fucking didn't get it. Yeah. You know, I put, I put me here and you there. And now that I'm in it, uh, like... They okay. Get it. Yeah. It almost like immediate, there's not even like a we need to. T- it's like I, I, yeah. I'm sorry, man. And I go, I totally. I'm just glad you made it, so you can understand that it wasn't personal. That it was just batting down the hatches. Uh, and and what you hope for is that when that all ends, in a sense, and then you're normal again and fucking just regular person. That as things start to the net the next season starts to come, and you're like, all right, I'm getting hot. A new normal is happening. Then it's even better yeah. because now you're like not dealing with uh, all the extra frills of being, you know, the bell of the ball. It, it's it's fun. It's great. There's a lot of good that comes with it, but you get lost in it. Yeah. Even if you think you've got your shit together, 
you get lost in it. So I have found that the last like eight or nine years of my life and career have been even more gratifying because now I'm I'm doing what a lot of you guys have done really successfully, which is like finding ways to cross pollinate and work with people. I don't want to just be loan anything. I, it, comedy is loan, right? Loan. Yeah. You're the you're out there. You everybody. You're at the helm. You're, it's for me as a kid that felt like so isolated as a kid, and all I ever wanted was community. I look now and go, we're in the best era, as you know, to be like, now you can really cross pollinate and collaborate and have fun. Yeah. Are there people that when you like, obviously you're doing it with Bobby and stuff and having your own success, but do you look and go like, is there like a dream collab that you would like to mm -hmm. have out there somewhere? Have you thought uh, about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, when I was a kid, I spoke about this on the other day. When I was a kid working with Jim on camera, Carrie would have been like the greatest thing. He was my boss for this show I did called I'm Dying Up Here. That's that, right. But Which was great. That was always my dream. Thank you, dude. That was my dream to like, still to this day, would be the killer to work on camera with that guy. Right. I don't think it'll ever happen now because of the circumstances, because I don't know how often he'll come back on right. camera. But uh, I think he will. I mean, I he still hope. seems to, I hope. you know, I, hope. I think it's all, you know, hey, listen, something beautiful is written. Yeah. That's that's where the hope turns exactly. into a possibility. I think he would come back if given the perfect project. And uh, yeah, that was one of those guys. Who is it for you? Who is there someone that you're like, man, I, to this day, I've always wanted to work with X, Y, Z. Oh, boy. I mean, recently, I, I thought I would love to do a tour with Louis C.K. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Because of where our relationship has come to over the years. And I think that that would be an exciting show. Yeah. I haven't talked to him about it, but I should. He has no idea that's great. I should, well, no, he doesn't I don't, know. I don't even know what but his gonna. personal agenda is. I know that he's, you know, he obviously crushing it and things are, are great for him. But I look and go, like, for me, that that's that would be a fucking wild live show to be a part of. Well, that's kind of like how, like, Chappelle and Rogan have done these duo arena Love shows it. together. Which I think Joe was saying it was, like, really organic. It wasn't, there was not, like, a... Uh, big pre-planned thing i think they both were like do you should we just i love it do it and it just yeah. stood like i saw dave uh and donnell down in australia and i was in australia at the beginning of the year and it was just it, like when you're with a crew of friends playing an arena show the best i was like this is this is what little kids think rock star shit is i brought i brought how however many people like to open and feature for me because i was like y you think it's going to be hard yeah but as long as you're funny you got it it's the best. And and it what's funny is the era I came up in was like that was really unusual when I came up to do an arena, not yeah. since dice. And there was a time when it might have even been Rogan and and some of those guys were like, that's not a comedy show. That's an event. That's something else. And I'd be like, I swear to God, it's a comedy show. But it is an event. It's also a comedy show it's, event. It's it's everything. But <laughs> yeah. I promise you, if you are funny, it's a fucking comedy show. And yeah. it was, it, I think some people felt like it was, at that time, it was, it's kind of funny to say now, like it was almost unusual. It was like this level of comedy, that's not, he's taking it past comedy where right. it should be in a theater. Sure. And it's it's bonkers. It's just people yelling in t-shirts. And then suddenly I see, Everyone's talk to a lot it. of these guys. Yeah. yeah it's, and, and everybody goes, oh, this is where you want to take your business to because why not have, you know, 5,000 people are laughing, 15,000, 25,000 people. As long as they're having a good time, they can hear you. Yeah. It's like, why not? Yeah, we did. I did the tour with uh, Bert. Bert did a tour and we did. Fully loaded? Yeah, we did yeah. a bunch of arenas and, you know, 15,000 at the Gorge. It was like, I mean, it's, it's a party. What to you, after all these years of playing a million different venues, what's your perfect number? Oh, wow. Um, As much as I play into, and like I just did Mohegan Sun again, which yeah. is like, I think when it's, filled it's right around 8500 yeah i did falls view which is have you done the new one the uh, falls view uh, there's a new theater casino that's almost like if you took the beacon theater and oh. just went and brought it up a little bit higher yeah it's the beacon and falls view both around 50 5500 yeah think they're the over 5000 yeah. because it's like uh it's like a wall it doesn't feel like yeah. they're going out it kind of feels like they're like a radio city love it played radio city awesome but it, it kind of goes far back you're like I'm in Radio City, but I like when they're on you sure. like that. So Falls View Casino is kind of my new favorite spot. Um, I think anybody could film a special there too. It's state of the art, beautiful. Um, but Beacon Theater is like Beacon's I mean, the one you, you for can't, you. Yeah, you can't. Uh, but there's a lot. I could sit here and list a lot of places. Did you ever play the Met in Philly? I don't the think Met kind of no. has a a huge 
uh, their second row goes all the way up to the sides. It's it was beautiful. It's one of the one of those theaters that I was like, this is like, yeah. it, you know, when you walk in sometimes pre-show and you're like, is it okay to be playing here? This is like a little too pretty for comedy. Right. Like it's yeah. a little too. It's like ornate, beautiful, carved designs. Right, right. And I'm talking about my asshole, and you're like, I don't know if this belongs right. in this room. The chandelier. It's yeah, got like you know dude. forty thousand different pieces of fucking crystal hanging. Yeah, like little cherubic an angels drawn on the <laughs> ceiling. You're like, do I deserve to be in this fucking room? I said that to my mom the first time I got to play Chicago theater. I thought this is so beautiful. much prettier oh, than I man. deserve. I Chicago was like. Theater. That, and that's home for me, so it was so overwhelming. We stood in the room for, like, I don't know, 30 minutes, and my mom was... I was just like, it's this is fucking crazy. When I was a kid, I saw Phantom of the Opera there. Do you know right. what I mean? I was, like, I was like, I couldn't really wrap my head back around playing there. It kind of felt yeah. beyond surreal. I so, think, so those are the numbers. But that kind of 55 is, like, you like those theaters. I like 55. If I was going to have, like, a perfect touring year, yeah, I would. it would be like... Um, I've always probably for 20 years when I first started doing like the 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 Penn State the larger venue like the Field House Penn State sure. I I love the Rolling Stones and I was always like I want to make it to that 30 I'm 32 years in but 30 years in when you're like I'm going to play that arena I'm going to play that shit hall then I'm going to come over here and play <laughs> this beautiful fucking theater then I'm going to do a pop in at this fucking place in the middle of nowhere yeah. to me that would be the ultimate like uh just coast to coast hitting every size venue yeah. Bring in a few of your friends. Bussing? You bus or no bus? Uh, you don't I, bus. I, I like buses, but I still have I still have the thing where I need to get home. You gotta I've get been back. like that. I gotta get yeah, home. And yeah. and not uh, and it's just my for my anxiety. I get anxious out on the road. I gotta right. I gotta go home and reset. What do you feel? You feel like it's you're 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 so vulnerable because you're not near what makes you feel the most comfortable? I I I've I don't know what it is. I just know this. The second I leave, I'm fine. I could yeah. stay out on the road for a year. If I once I'm there and you said, like, let's just stay out on the road, you would not see me struggling. No. I'd fucking have a great time. We would eat great places. I, you know, a lot of people. We'd go to the ball games. We'd right. But there's something inside of me that's like, I need to go home and reset. I think it's maybe just not having the home as a kid that I looked forward to getting home to. Yeah. It's just something in my conditioning, in my in my mechanics that are like, go home, reset clean the duffel bag out fucking right. get back out there get back yeah you must like your home you fucking put your special there which i thought I did, was wild man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're inviting people literally into your home yeah did that, that was... e did you ever was there ever second thoughts where you're like is this a terrible idea these no. humans are in my house no i already had a stalker who like found out where i lived two stalkers that found out where i lived i already had two stalkers two stalkers same year <laughs> wow, that's yeah so and not even at like peak I'm 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 the shit. It yeah. was like way after when right. everything kind of fucking settles. Like that's when they now? come in. Yeah, when they, when everything <laughs> slows down, they can't get to you when you're hot, baby. But you know what? I found out one of them was just starting to watch the specials at like oh four oh five. I was like, oh, so for them, right. I'm at fucking the top, like yeah. <laughs> I'm the new guy. But uh, doing this special at the house was. First of all, anybody Googles anybody, you can see where somebody lives. So I had yeah. I had a guy one time in a, in the nicest, scariest way possible go, if I was ever going to break onto your property, I'd start here and come around. Like, he drew me a little fucking map. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I can do this because when I was 12, we used to meet on either my porch or um, Mr. McNamara's porch. And that's where the neighborhood would, would come together, smoking, drinking, uh, cut-ups, everybody get up. And I would do like... This is Mr. McKenzie mowing his lawn. Like, I would fucking have at it with everybody, and I was funny. Right. And it was just being on the stoop, improvising. Some serious conversations start happening. You know what I mean? Like, there's, all right, these two are getting into it a little bit. Uh, I'm going to say something funny, try to break it up. And from 12 years old all the way to even doing uh, Boston Garden, I talked to Marty Culner. He said, We're, you know, the garden, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I want to do the garden, or I want to do my front porch. And he was like, Fucking do the garden. garden. Let's do the yeah, garden. Let's do Which the he, he came back. He actually just directed, Marty Culner directed the new one. But it was something at 12 years old I loved when I moved into this house at 13 years ago. I just sat there one day. I was like, I'm going to film a special here someday. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bunch of people bust in. They didn't know they were coming up. They didn't know where they were being. They just knew it was Dane Cook show somewhere. They didn't know they were going to be on my front lawn for a couple of hours. And when we, we uh, they built some risers, Marty and his production. So we had about. 600 people on my fucking front lawn Holy including shit. like a few hundred on these beautiful risers that they built but I, I mean this sincerely like i knew the show i was thought i was going to do but when you're on your porch it's so it how you behave is so different because even if you want to put on a little bit of like showmanship 
You can't. Yeah. I'm in a hoodie on my porch. Right. And so it ended up being something that I think is truly special and unique. And I think it of um, course. it feels like different from anything I've ever done only because when I got out there, I started talking about stuff that I had no intention of getting into. It just, so it was not uh, a lot of it was improv that you didn't no, have written for the special? No, no. It was it, The reason I did Friday and Saturday night, I did uh, an hour and 40 minutes Friday night, which was most of the sp- Above It All special. And then Saturday, I just rolled for like 2.45 and talked to pretty much everybody in Holy the porch. Holy shit. Learned everybody's story. It was basically a crowd work special in some ways, sure. but I was still throwing bits in because I had ready pre-COVID tour, the Tell It Like It Is tour. That was ready to be a special. That got fucked up by COVID. Then during COVID, I start working all the other material, and I had two specials. So I was like, all right, I'll film all the pre-COVID stuff on Friday, and then Saturday I'll do the next one. So the next one's called Gritty and Pink, and that's going to come out at the end of the summer. That's so, so, but you knew at the beginning, or this kind of organically happened, where you were like, "We'll just shoot two nights. Maybe it'll be two specials. Maybe it'll be one." I, I knew it would be two specials. I just thought it was going to be the hour before COVID, and then sure. the hour like kind of during the banter, and then like it, the second show. Although funny, when I edit it, it feels more like a kind of a podcast come to life. Or if you know, you do a show where you're like really improvisation. You know, it's very improvisational. Yeah. It it's. It's special because you're like, oh, I'm getting laughs in the moment, and then I'm weaving into some bits, and then I'm going back. So I, I, I don't know if it'll – I think it's one of those things that for the rest of my career, whatever I do, n- nothing is going to feel as different from stand-up but still stand-up as that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, man. In here – we pour whiskey, whiskey. This episode of Whiskey Ginger is brought to you by BetterHelp. I've spoken uh, uh, pretty candidly on the show for a very long time about BetterHelp, about getting therapy. Uh, I think it is a wonderful thing to get stuff off your chest, uh, lighten your load, drop your shoulders a little bit, make the day a little bit easier, okay? Um, and BetterHelp uh, does just that. You know, they help you get to a place um, where you feel comfortable again with what's going on in the world. You know, it's a little, it's a little tough. Sometimes uh, we can't get to sleep at night. Your brain just won't turn off. It happens to me all the time. I can't get my brain to stop spinning. Um, A great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through. And talking them through with somebody um, is probably one of the best things I've found in my life to get on to the next step of life so I can feel more peace with uh, everything in the world. Therapy gives you a place to do that so you can get out of those negative thought cycles and find some mental and emotional peace. And that's what I think BetterHelp offers. And that's why, you know, I really do think... Um, giving therapy a try is the best. If you're ready to give therapy a try, you know, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely done online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. From the comfort of your own private personal space, you can do this anywhere you'd like. Uh, I think it's much worth your time and your try. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash whiskey today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, better dot com slash whiskey. This episode of Whiskey Ginger is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey, I've talked about Squarespace so much on this show, it's because I believe in it. If you've ever created a website, I created my first one, I think in 07 or 08, when I was out here, and boy, oh boy, was it a mess. It was a disaster. There was these like awful templates to put together. I had no idea what I was doing. I think I just had a picture of me like cross-eyed on the front, uh, and that was just like the whole image, and then you had to scroll down to get to anything else, and it never tracked correctly. Those good old days of website creation at the beginning of our comedy careers, Now you don't got to do that anymore. Whether you're selling something, uh, you're pushing something out to the world, uh, you want people to hear your voice, make yourself known, Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out, succeed online. Whether you're just starting out managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to uh, create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, whatever you got, all in one place, all on your terms. Um, a lot of people uh, have hit us up to say what they like about Squarespace. We've showed their their sites on here. Um, so many extensions, email campaigns, um, and my favorite that I've talked about is the analytics. I'm using the insights to grow my business. Learn where your site visits and sales are coming from. Uh, analyze which channels are the most effective. That way I can find out where you guys are. So when I come to Boston, I know that many fans are in Boston. They're giving me an extra click, bro. And I love that. I love using the analytics um, and the tools on there for email campaigns to blast out to the world to say, hey, I'm back on tour. Come see your boys. So if you want to create a site, if it's time for you, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, uh, go to squarespace.com slash whiskey to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a main. One more time. It's squarespace.com. All right, go over there. For a free trial, when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash whiskey. Save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Ginger. I like gingers. 
tell me this. I, I have to jump backwards because okay. it sits in my brain. Yeah. What's like the what's one of the best pieces of advice is that Jerry gave you? Because you would talk to him that often. Oh shit, Jerry Lewis, man, he was a fascinating guy. Yeah, but like I just for, for people that don't know, if they're if you're if you're a comedy fan and you might not know who that is, please look up Jerry Lewis because yeah. to me, it's one of those things where how do you get remembered or how will you be remembered? Yeah. And I don't know if a lot of young people know Jerry Lewis right. or know know his stuff and 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 they may have seen it seen him through their dad maybe, but he was such an iconic well, he was original. Our, he figure. was Jerry Lewis. Uh, he was Jerry Lewis was for Jim Carrey what a lot of us would look at Jim Carrey as. Correct. Yeah. Totally. But I mean, he definitely begged and borrowed from him for sure because he's got the same. There's a lot and of the Martin same. Short. Yeah, Mar yeah. Well, Marty does. Uh, Marty does it to a degree where. Um, Jerry transforms into the character very like you see him physically change shape. Right. But I I have to say I think Martin Short does it better than anyone ever. Like Jiminy Glick to me may be unequivocally the best character transformation I've ever seen. Where the voice, the uh, the eyes, like his mouth. Right. He chameleoned into a, a new human being. Yeah, and and a character that also because of Buddy Love and you think about that the duality of being like tremendously funny. Uh, like outrageously funny, but there was still some real vulnerable vulnerability totally, in there, and yeah. like something very kind of oddly lovable about him, even as he was kind of like you know taking somebody down peg. So Jerry Lewis, for me growing up, was like I understood that he was for a good ten year run the biggest star on the planet with Dean Martin, yeah. Martin and Lewis. Yeah, you know uh, they were like Bieber level. Look out a window, <laughs> yeah. and millions of people are outside the hotel. And not only did I learn a lot watch, just watching his uh, confidence, right? Yeah. But understanding he writes and directs a lot of these things that yeah. he's doing. And then he did, did drama. I see him in King of Comedy, and he's very good. And then I read his book on, on filmmaking, and I'm like, oh, he's prolific. And then also he's an innovator. He, he invented playback. Playback on a set. Is, that's Jerry Lewis. That's his. Wow. He literally went to Tokyo, met with the head of this company, and said, I need to be able to see myself on set. I need to be able to ha play it back because I don't know if my choreographer, he owns the patent for fucking for, for that. Holy shit. Yeah, goosebumps. Like he, so this is a guy that when I finally had the opportunity to get to know him, I think he was 82 when I, when I started. A young to, lad. Yeah, yeah. yeah 82. <laughs> and he was, uh, but 82 and as curious and as just incredibly um, gracious, yeah. you know, uh, still was studying and understanding the way if he met you, let's say he was going to meet you, he would he'd look up your work. He'd sit down with you. He'd know you're special. He'd tell you what you're thinking. He'd 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 find a moment. Wow. And I I found like myself talking about like my Madison Square Garden gig with him one day, and him just literally being like, "Now the moment that you do the Civil War flute, and then you and he's talking about like the dedication to physical, and I bet your toe was in it. Your toe was in that moment with your fingers, and that. But the thing that he said to me that was probably the most. Um, he was also a very intense guy. There was a darkness in him that because of my dad, like I've been friends with some people over the years that are like, uh, some people would say like, I'm kind of intimidated by that guy. I'd be like, oh, that's like my sweet spot. Right. That's like lovable to me. So his, the way some people didn't quite know how to approach Jerry, uh, I think he liked that I'd come in, I'd be like, with the attitude, really? <laughs> you know, and immediately yeah. he'd be like, ah! You know, yeah. he was just waiting for somebody to come in and be like, well, relax right you had your decade okay <laughs> it was 50 fucking decades ago he just loved that shit but his big thing was he called me one time i was really honestly at like the lowest probably moment of my personal and professional life everything had just kind of caught up to me I, I really felt like i was you know i just didn't know what i wanted to do next no phone calls coming in uh you know movies were starting to drop comedy comedy movies kind of ended in a sense, like I did my last comedy film, and then like two years later, I started getting calls going like, "No more comedy films are being made because what would happen is if you came out and you had like a thirty-two million dollar opening, or we had a couple that were like in the you know mid fifteen million or whatever, and then there was three other maybe comics that came out and were, were duds. Little did I know that that was also meaning that my opportunities yeah. were not going to be like only Sandler had it the untouchable, best, man. untouchable, untouchable, yeah. in in, in not even arguably so. He always delivered. Yeah. Good movie, off kilter, whatever. So I found myself in a place where I was like, oh, I don't really, you know, and I was getting kind of uh, negative. 
which is not really like me. I try to like try to find some optimistic way through anything. And Jerry called me one day, and I never wanted to like burden him with stuff, even though we'd gotten pretty close. But one day, I, he's like, "No, really, what's on your mind?" And I told him, I was like, "You know," and I just feel like nobody wants to participate with me. And some people, they they, I'm, it was that time when uh, when people go like, I don't know if you ever got this even in casting, where people go, "No, no, we know him. They won't even meet." Because yeah. they know they know you. Oh, we know him. Yeah, we know him. We've seen his stuff. Yeah, we'll keep him in mind. It's like, no, I'm fucking. I'm ten pounds heavier. I'm fucking did it. I, I'm, no, no, I'm we different. Know we we know him. We saw him in 04 do a thing. Right. So I was just convoluted and you know. And he called me up and he goes, "I want you to get a piece of paper and get a pen, my boy, right now." And I did. And he, I stole my desk right now. And he said, and he goes first. He goes, "We don't do negative, negative. We get rid of negative." It's, it's poison, it's toxic. You start up every day with this piece of paper. And it, keep in mind, it, I'm, it's because I'm feeling so fucked up, I don't even want to write down what he has to, I'm really like, mm -hmm. okay. And he goes, you know, he, he says, write down, I'm a very important person. I mean something to people. I'm a very smart man. And he goes, and remind yourself that with the, that knowledge, you can do good for people. And that's it. He goes, wow. and don't ask or look for anything else. No, you, you've had enough. You've had moment after moment. Yeah. Help other people and remember these things. So that, that's on my desk, and it really helped me. And he helped me. Actually, every Sunday my calls with Jerry were like, kind of got me through a lot of turbulent moments in my life. Tough times. Tough times, man. Yeah. yeah that's powerful that he, uh, honestly, the, the, the comedian in me has to think of, as I'd be writing <clears> that down, the smart man part, I'd have been like, I can't, Jerry, I will not write that part down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's like... I went to Arizona State. Like, I'm not going to fucking write that down. Dude. I'll write that I'm important to people part, but I'm not... Because I don't want someone to walk into my office and be like, this fucking dickhead thinks he's smart. Like, you got, C, you got C's and D's in high school, you fucking... That, that was me, dumb as a box of rocks. So I, that, that would have been the initial comedic moment. But it's beautiful yeah. to have someone so important and powerful in comedy... Um, I think what he was saying, like though, that. even from that from that phrase, but getting to know him was... We we all have something to to um, to contribute. Yeah. So we are all smart in a sense. If you stop letting the noise mm. take your focus away and get back to what is what is your purpose here? The lottery ticket of a life that we all have. You know, you're smart if you know how to figure out. Okay, what what gets me fucking pumped up every morning to get out there and continue to try to find ways to entertain. For me, ways to entertain people. On your down day, though. Yeah. What is Dane Cook on his down day? When you're like, okay, man, I'm ch I'm logging off. I'm not doing any of the shit. Because you hum at a frequency, dude. Like, I, I, for as little as I know you, but as much as I've seen you, you're never not moving, right? You're work, you work all the fucking time. And when you do take time for yourself, when you do, what is it? What's your, like, I'm blasting off a little bit? I would say probably the last, well, I've been with Kelsey now for five years, and I, I'm, like that like holy shit like the best uh you know the best times of my life over the last five years with her but even like a few years back i remember one time listening to somebody in an interview might have been around 08 09 and it was like the another person talking about oh, i wish that i had learned to slow down and take vacations and look back on my life and it, and i was like i'm fucking doing that i'm 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 going to change the entire system of when I'm working, I'll still give that percentage of energy, yeah. but I'm going to give the same percentage of energy into off days. So I started building up a community of friends and people away from the business, you know, regular kind of lives, Humans. Nor regular, normal fucking people. And I'd say like the last eight years, I'm the guy that when I'm not, you know, out there, I'm enjoying life to the fullest. I'm, t I'm traveling, I'm doing stuff that like, uh, I'm being curious and I'm doing things that I've wanted to do probably as much as stand up, which is like explore. Yeah. You know? So yeah, that's like my, my day or like just a down day. I look at it as, um, uh, if I just fucking take, I go sheet, sheet therapy. I'm like, that's needed. I don't fight it. I don't fight the down day. I just kind of go like, all right, everything's off. Computer goes off. I don't go in the office and I just fucking, you know, I just handle it. Bomb out in bed for a little yeah, while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't, I do used you, to. Will you eat a meal in bed? Are you this guy? Well, I eat a meal in bed. Yeah. 
I'll eat a meal. You a will? Bit. Yeah, I'll get a fucking Joe's meatball sub once in a while and just <laughs> open up that tin foil magic and just fucking. It feels so good eating in bed. Uh, and my wife has no idea that I do it sometimes when she's gone, but yeah. man, I like it so much. Right. And then you lay down, you feel the crumbs on your back, oh, and you're like, God, I did that. Dude, I love it so much. <laughs> Something about eating in fucking bed because it's it, it's absolutely like my mom would be like, Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> like I, you're like, this is I bought this house. Like you feel so, I feel so free. Like I'm supposed to be able to. Like that's how weird it is in my backyard sometimes with the dog. That what do you got? What dog? She's a little. She's a slut mutt. She's like a, a cocker spaniel terrier. Uh, a slut she, mutt. She's a slut mutt, dude. It's funny because well, I call we my Rhodesian down Ridgeback down a rich bitch. Oh, rich bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's how she walked mutt. in. <laughs> she's a slut mutt. They found her downtown LA. She's a and she's like a ragtag lunatic. Yeah. But when I'm in the backyard with the dog, sometimes, uh, like in the mornings. I'm naked and I'll I'll take her out there naked. Yeah. And I think I'm being a I'm being bad, but no one can see me. So I'm like, because why do I feel dog. bad about this? <laughs> well, it's like I'm naked with a dog, but who gives a shit? Because I sleep naked when I walk her out in the morning. I literally grab coffee naked and I walk out there naked. Yeah. Nobody can see me, but for some reason I can hear my mom being like, What are you doing? Put on some fucking clothes, you pig. Like <laughs> it's the dog. She knows. And she what knows does your I wife sleep think? naked. She couldn't care less. Doesn't care. Well, she do. she also, I start when I, I started sleeping naked years and years and years yeah. ago. I did the same thing for a lot of years. I like it. I, I've never. I, when I started I was, doing shorts about six or seven years ago, just randomly. I was like, I think I'm ready to fucking be ready to go to shorts. Tonight. Yeah. I just I've been naked Once for so long. Once my stalker long. came into the into play, I was <laughs> I like, I gotta be need, ready yeah. to fuck. Yes. I gotta get ready to fucking. Once the guy showed you the map to your house, you're like, I'll put on something. I guess. <laughs> I just like being naked in bed because uh, I always get really hot. I run really hot, and at night, as a kid. I would sweat sometimes, and okay. I fucking hated it. And then I got older, and I was like, when I get to sleep naked in my own house, I'm going to sleep butt fucking naked. I was in a hotel in New York City, um, naked, and I used to always do a thing where I'd only be under the sheet. I'm always on my stomach, and it's all, it's, I'm covered. So you yeah. can't see me in the bed, basically. The cocoon. And I also don't use the pillow. So I'm in the flattest part of the bed. I'm flat on my, usually I'm on my stomach. And again, I was naked. And all of a sudden, I wake up to hearing two guys' voices like, that's a computer. Computers right there. Grab, no. the, grab the one. I was yeah. The two guys had gotten into my hotel room, and I'm spread out and I'm naked. And then they get fucking really, really quiet. And it's the quiet that I know. One of them went, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm gonna jump up in three seconds and I'm gonna fight naked for my fucking life. I'm dude. I'm Andrew. I'm fucking terrified. I'm literally because I knew the minute it went quiet, they they realized. So. One, two, three, and I fucking launch up in the air, and just as I'm fucking getting out of the sheet, they're running out the door. <laughs> and what we found out was, there's a couple of guys, they had like maintenance outfits on, and they must have gotten a master key or something like that, and they had broken into like four rooms that day, and then they were in my room, so of course the, nothing the manager Nothing got stolen stuff, though. But nothing got, uh, no. No, they didn't take anything From out of the you. room when they ran. No, they might have actually, there might have been one thing that I never found, but they they ran out of the room, and then after that day, I don't think I ever wanted to sleep naked again because I was so fucking terrified mm -hmm. that I was going to have to fight two dudes but completely naked. being in the paper, if it did work out, Dane Cook wrestles and saves... Uh, hotels, <laughs> hotel people from being robbed and butt naked. You just naked the on the news, just like, listen, dude, I had to do what I had to do, like a post game in a, for a basketball player. I don't player. think I was in like a peak physical condition moment though, because that's when like men's health is like, we want to put you on the cover, and I'm like, yeah, I'm a little dad bottomed mm -hmm. out right now. Can we do next <laughs> next season potentially? Well, they should make a men's getting health. They should make a men's like our, on our way up. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, let's go back. Let's also glorify a regular body where. Yeah, I work out, but I can't work out for a six pack anymore. Right. No. I, I want to stay healthy, but I also I have no. When people are like, when I, you see on the internet "summer bod," that ha, that like that phrase, mm -hmm. it's so meaningless because we live in summertime all year round. Right. So I can't even trick myself into being like, "Hey, eat for a summer bod" or something. For me, it doesn't matter. Wait, how old are you now? Forty. Oh, fuck. Okay, good. You got like four more years. And then it falls can... off? Well, it's not even that it falls off. It's just your body goes through some kind of metamorphosis. Everybody said to me, uh, for, oh, yeah, 43, 44. I was like, dude, I'm f no way. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm from a, a athletic family, broad shoulders, everyone's V'd out. I'm like, no, no, even naturally. Dude, I hit 44, and literally my body was like, I want to try something with you. <laughs> Watch this. Yeah. <laughs> just like... I'm going through it right now. I have a bad back. I'm literally, I'm on pills because I'm in, I, I, Herniated a disc again. Okay. I already fra had fractures on oh, my back, that's so I'm half. I'm already there, dude. I'm going through it, but I'm fighting it because I'm like, I know I can repair this without having surgery. 
but it is. I'm in the I'm in getting in the older white guy category of back and knee injuries. Right. It's like my dad too. It's like the same. Every older white guy I know, it's back and knees. Yeah. It's it's where at some point you're gonna just for no reason at all just lean on something to go. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's when it. you know you've really arrived. Well, you, but will you it, make it make a new? Uh, uh, <laughs> and someone's like, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. You all right? <laughs> Yeah. What's now what you know, obviously you're having this incredible, you know, push with Bobby and yourself. It's like, do you do you map out like do you have like five year plan in your mind? Are you like willy nilly? Do you how how much do you go? That's my objective and I need to do everything possible over the course of the next few years. Where do where do you cut like I know uh, sorry to ask no, an answer, but like, don't do it. I love being behind the camera. I've had a chance to direct some stuff before the strike and stuff. My production company, we were starting to go on a, a, a series that I was going to be behind the camera. Like, I look forward to that part of my career also being like off stage. And now I'm kind of in the production side. Where do you want to take stand up and where are you kind of going? Yes, yeah, I, lo- I want to do stand up until I'm dead. And then, as far as like <clears throat> acting goes and the other side, I have no hope to be on the other side of the camera. That scares me. I leave it to the prof- I'm not, I would never, I'm, I would like to create a show with and for someone else and be very behind the scenes. Right. Like I'm big, I'm like big producer, on, producer, yeah, but not yeah. like, not in, n- I'm going to be far, far away from it. Okay. I just want to like help make it happen for people that I think have something good. But it, but it's interesting because somebody who enjoys acting like you do, I found when I started directing, like, um, actors like they enjoyed talking to me because it was like i knew really simple to go it's just play with whatever you want to do there like little adjustments as opposed to somebody who comes in and like tries to fucking manhandle everything that you're doing and you don't feel like the creative freedom yeah don't you think that like you speak actor oh definitely you i mean you that the advantage is there i just always um I hate actors. That's really what it is. Okay. That's what it is. <laughs> Fuck. No, you know what it really is? I just don't have the patience. I'm not good at that. And you have to be very patient to work yeah. with people. Like the, the best directors I've worked with, they have unbelievable patience in a way where you're like, man, they're good at spinning multiple personality plates of understanding how to talk to Dane and how to talk to her and how to talk to him. And they do speak to everyone differently because everyone is a, everyone deserves a little something different. Right. Which is a skill set that I don't think people understand about directing. Right. That, so the the micromanagement of that, if you have the ability to do so, fucking yeah. kudos. I I'm so bad at that that uh, it gives me anxiety. Like for right. me, I'm good with you in the scene, in the moment, with right. the play, with the I kid. love it. But outside of that, yeah, that's tough. So, I mean that 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 I mean that's that's to me the second half of my what's next for me. I want um, I really want to tour the fucking world. I've never toured the world, and like for me. I want to play London so bad. I want to play Australia. I want to play. I want. I want to play all over the fucking world. And we've just are now getting the taste of we're probably going to do it. Yeah. So that's been the goal. Is like in the next couple of years, I really want to. I want to tour the fucking world. That's awesome. I've man. never. I've traveled it. I've never played it. I mean, you've played. I mean, how many countries do you think you've played? Do you know? Bunch. I mean, except for yeah. I mean, a lot. <laughs> yeah. A ton. A, lot. a ton. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's to go someplace else, especially just knowing like. Where I started, how I had to start to get to where I'm, you know, at now, the privilege of playing where whatever country, you go home feeling different. You yeah. really do. It's like it's I, I can't tell you what it is, but like you really go home being like, wow, man, I, I can't believe like I, I got to travel this far distance and people appreciated what I put forth. That's why that. I think it's so fucking rad. It's, it's so what cool. what country do you remember? Was there ever a country you played where English was uh it was still the, you know, they spoke English, but it was so broken that it was a tough show. I, they had me do a show when I was in Nice, France, yeah, uh, many years ago. That was tricky tough. because it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't even at a place where it was mostly in- English speaking. I speak fucking, I say like double I know one letter, <laughs> literally in French, um, and so that's W. Yes, that, that's W. Yeah. That's W. Yeah. Um, but that was that was really difficult, and yet it was kind of funny the way like. What is Johnny Carson once said? You use everything, yeah. and at that point when I'm like, <clears throat> okay, nothing you know with vernacular is really gonna fly. So I got to keep it like real simple and just go for stuff that like I I know that's kind of like their version of like local humor. I'm like, what's that fucking cheese I keep eating over here? That guy, and you start like <laughs> digging into it. So I I made it work, but thank God it was a it was a 20 minute show because if they said this is gonna be a 55 minute or an hour, I would have been fucked. Nah, I gotta. Go. I would have been out of there. I would have given myself the hook. Yeah, right. Um, but so that was one of the tricky. Nice but, France. But other places that I've had the chance to go to and 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 places that so I self-distributed above it all. 
and and we did English speaking territories, obviously around the world. But now, like they wanted it in Portuguese. There's countries that have oh, reached wow. out. And, like Korea, I have a big Korean following. So, as you would, I, I, who you know, you don't know. But I'll tell you, even like right now, like um, we're putting it out in Mandarin because do you know in China they are in like 2001 of their comedy boom. Where comedy, where stand up comedy is right now just in getting, China. Just the turn of the century. <laughs> it's it's becoming, it's almost the fucking hottest thing. Right. So to be able to have content that is finding one of the biggest fan bases in the world and like in. in Wait till they hear about Dave Chappelle. Uh, right? It's they're like going to fucking gonna lose their mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's like just to be able to have content in other parts of the world and, and then to be able to tour and see those places, it, it, dude, it's going to be fucking gratifying Incredible. as fuck. Yeah. Who dubs it when, when it's Portuguese and stuff like that for your other. Do you who? know they don't like the dub? They, do, they oh, actually. They don't? I've tried, I did a dub thing and they were like, they prefer uh, closed caption huh. because they're learning English as well. A oh. lot of them are like, I, I've had people say, like, I learned English entirely from your special whatever it might be so it's kind of wild they'd rather a closed caption that's you know what's so funny somebody said that uh somebody had told me that their sister or something when they grew up in eastern europe learned english from watching american syndicated television shows yeah and that was like the best way that they learned how to right how to understand like cultural phrasings and because the mannerisms it's the same way when you when we learn another language and you think you know it but then they a local is like no one really <laughs> says it like that. Right. What you're saying is uh, how high is the rooftop, but you want to say, let's go upstairs. Right. You know what I mean? And it's just the slang that they learn from the TV, which makes me feel so dumb when we go to other countries and they're like, I speak four languages. I'm like, I, I don't even... I remotely know English. We're never going to have to worry about that anymore because now there's a button you can put on and you go like, uh, I need to find a restaurant and you hit the button and it says it in whatever country you're in. in oh, that's language. fucking rad. So it's all like, dude, we're done. Te like tech, We're toast, dude. We're fucking toast, man. This is AI, by the way. I don't know if people know this. This whole I time, I'm not me and Dane's not Dane. We I haven't <laughs> been here. He's out of town. I'm gone. How great. And then right now, we just, <laughs> just zap into fucking zeros I, and ones. I got into a tech conversation today. Sorry if this is no, outside. No, go for it, baby. I got into a tech conversation today. We are talking about, there's this woman. She was fucking, she, she ran like three people over. And then in the in the police station, she's like laughing. I saw this Dancing. Girl. Okay, yeah, you saw, I saw that, this right? video, yeah. And the guy's like, you just killed fucking two people. Like, and she's like doing her dances yeah. and whatever. And I was talking to my buddy, and he was like, oh, he was like, dude, back in the day, she would be fucking whatever. It was like, uh, she'd have to wear a board around her neck. And it was like early fucking colonization. You'd have to, like, they'd paint your fucking arms green or whatever. And I was like, dude, it's happening again right now because when that Apple Reality Pro comes out, which already has facial recognition, and there's already, you could look up any face on your phone. If she walks down the street and you're going to have some device on, the scarlet letter will be digital. Wow. So whatever your past is, it'll be like Grand Theft Auto. When you when somebody's stats come up, in 10 years, that woman doesn't even realize when someone looks at her, they're going to know exactly who Murderer. she is. Yeah. Yeah. Laughed at fucking killing two people. That, by the way, that, yeah. well, she will be out. Don't invite two parties. <laughs> <laughs> Does not tip. <laughs> what? You're a murderer, but I, you don't tip? And then down at the bottom, it's like, Terrible dancer. Just yeah. things that are like, that's really not appropriate, but that's good to know as to well. Know we don't need to know that. <laughs> that is so, well, I saw that video. That video is so daunting that she's kind of so unaware yeah. of what she's done. But I also think there's a huge disconnect, not to get too internet deep. There is, we talked about parasocial relationships on one of our shows about people know you, even though they don't know you. And now people know the world in a way where it isn't real. So when something bad happens, they almost think it didn't happen. Where they're like, I didn't do that. You're like, yes, you did. Right. And she was like, but I got to go to school. She kept saying. Yeah. Because I think her mind was she like, had a $400 did it happen? Or something. Yeah. Did it, right. It, is it real? Right. Or am I just putting this together well, with the world? Was she, of, that, was, was she that fucked up? I don't think so. Well, man. I, yeah, I think it was something I else. think it was traumatic. Trauma, she trauma, has trauma. Yeah. And so your brain is tricking itself into like, this, this kind of can't be, this isn't really free. I mean. We'll get over this tomorrow. I'll wake up and it'll be all okay. Right. But I do think there is something tricky that the internet is doing to not just the young generation, but us, include everybody, that there's times where when I wake up in the morning, I have to cognizantly be like, don't touch your phone. Right. Because my hand like goes to the table as I go to take a piss. Dude. It's creepy. It's like, yeah. why am I grabbing that fucking thing? Right. It, it, it's that. And it's also, and I had to go through this a long time ago, the understanding of there's a version of me in that device. Oh yeah. And that is a narrative that both good and bad has nothing to do with me. 
right. very little, like a modicum of like, well, I did do that. And I do know these people, but more than people even realize, it's like, you've been splashed on the internet. You've had your sure. shit. I've had my shit. And then you're like, okay, this is now like five versions away from something that wasn't even completely true to begin with. So that, that for me, I, I laughed about it. I, I've tried to turn it into a bit in some form, but it's not, but like, I'm like, there's me. And then there's two versions of me online. There's one that's done a lot of amazing shit. And it's kind of like, you know, heralded. And that's not all me, but there's some great stuff that you're like, oh, that's the love version. Sure. But then there's this nefarious version that like, if, and I'll look every couple of years, you'd be like, all right, somebody sent me I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I'm like, wow, this is fucking nasty, man. But it's fucking good. Mm. It's so, it's edited well. <laughs> it's so good that you're like. High production level. That you're kind of like. Who knows? I wrote a guy once and I'm like, yo, you got most of this wrong, but this is really good. I go, dude, you edited this so fucking well that I think I might share it. And, and I don't, and it's wrong. It's so you have me so wrong, but you edited this so fucking good. Yeah. And he's like, oh, dude, thanks, man. I spent a lot of time on it. And I was like, yeah, the clickbait title. Can we maybe change it? Maybe just the title. <laughs> yeah. is all, but you can keep it. I'm not, I do. I'm not telling He thought I was going to call him and be like, I was like, no, dude, this is fucking really good. But both of those things are kind of existing. And then you, you meet people and depending on what they've read, they're either pleasantly surprised or, they, oh. or they're prepared for battle. And you're kind of like, yeah, no, I'm just act, act, kind of actually a little bit more milk toast than either narrative, but the internet version of lives is it's it's fascinating, but it's so not anything close to it's not who you what are. you represent. It can't be who you are. Yeah, yeah, your philosophy, your ideals, your like outside of like content you create, just the way other people observe it. it, it everybody's projecting, right? Yeah. Everybody's projecting at all times. The internet provides you the chance to go like, I don't like that part of them. Cause I don't like that part of me. So I'm going to, and then it's suddenly it's like fodder and yet it's, it is yet. It's the reality that is you, that it's version of reality, you yeah. is out there. It, it's out there. It's being discussed that he is being uh, talked about, criticized. There's new comments five years after a video that meant nothing. <laughs> and somebody goes, here's my take. And it's, it's fucking fascinating. It is funny when it's like seven years later and someone's like cool teeth dork. And you're like, wow. <laughs> This guy reached, man. That's <laughs> fucking great, dude. Well, I, I'll say this. The internet, uh, as toxic as it can be, has the ability to also be wonderful, which is, I think, what I've gathered with this little fan base of people that uh, want to peel into a different mindset. Oh, of, for sure. Of the guests, because I think they want... More than anything, see, this lane, awesome. Well, they want to see the real version of fucking people. And you're, you're going to get as close as you can and this version versus something that's so pointed and, and almost like documentarian style where people nowadays are like, what's the narrative? You're like, well, that, does there always have to be a fucking narrative? But can I ask you this? As a person that's now had your success with stand-up and going out there and doing bad friends, uh, are you, I, I, I've seen a lot of shifts in comedy. You know, I've seen different people on the cover of Rolling Stone. It's a political era. It's a sketchy era. It's a fucking alt era. It's the mainstream era. And, doesn't it seem like we're getting into a place where people coming out to a show, although they love a, a great story or joke, they want it to be more participatory. Oh yeah, because they're now conditioned to be like, no, I want to be a part of it. Yeah, I think I think there's a duality. Yeah. I think what's happening now a little bit is because of the podcast world and the live world and the internet world, they do want to be more involved. But now it's also bringing people into the comedy world where. Let's say they didn't work stand-up fans. They like the podcast world. They come to a show and they're like, fuck, I love stand-up. Then they like learn the rules. Uh, Do you know what I mean? It's almost yeah. like when I take a friend golfing, I love golf. And I'll take a buddy who's like, you know, golf twice. And, you know, they'll go, dude, I didn't know that that's what you have to. It's like, it's no big deal. You're yeah. learning. But once they fall in love and they know like, oh, there's just a little parameters we have to abide by. And then they yeah. become this whole new. Yeah. They're like you breeding new fans. Yeah. Out. There's yeah, almost yeah. something sexy about bring him into the world and be like, do you like this? There's way more of me. You can go see him and her and them. And, and then it becomes like, holy shit, you open yeah. them to this new, that's the best part of this to connect with them and to go, totally. come on the fuck in. I, it, the cross pollination is yeah. like something that again, I, I kind of touted it and enjoyed it. The only thing that, that I found was like, I came out of the ear. I was on tech so much for so many years oh, yeah. that by the time it was really in vogue, 
I was like tapped out. I was like tapped out, dude. I was like, I fucking wrote everybody on MySpace and Facebook <laughs> for like nine years. Like everybody. I'm insane. I'm Why like, you gotta hire someone else to do it. And then it was like five years later, and everybody was like, yeah, my podcast is killing it. And I'm like, oh fuck, that is really taking off. It, shit, right when I dipped out, everybody's fucking podcast yeah, started. Like, it was there too early. Man. I, no, I was it, it's yeah, I feel like the fuck I feel like the Celtics in the 80s or like any any pro player that's like Fuck, those those deals were not there for me when I said I was loving the game <laughs> yeah. and maybe an endorsement once in a while. Forty million? <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Can you imagine those contracts were back in the day with them? Dude, I mean, honestly, in the eighties, what did those guys really get paid? Truly? What, oh, nothing. It was like, no. Nah. I mean, I think I think like, like bonuses for winning, right, and shit like that. Yeah, and at, but at most, most of those guys who weren't stars or they weren't really like franchising star players. So you were making, you know, tens of thousands of dollars yeah. in a sport that, quite frankly, was dying tremendously. The NBA was in dire straits. Right. So, like, you think now, those guys, it would be fucking so hard to see these kids now, like, a a shit, a shitty, you know, a shitty D-League player is still making more than you made at but, the height. But even in, in entertainment, like, I got a couple of friends of mine, you know, they're like 20 years old. They're, they've never been a part of Hollywood. They don't understand agents. Right. They don't give a fuck. They don't know a development deal. They're making tens of thousands of dollars more yeah. a month or whatever yeah. for whatever they're creating. They don't know SAG. They don't know fucking Writers they Guild. They don't need it. They don't know. I, and when I tell them about some of the things that we've had to do over the years, to be, quite literally, they're like, you're stupid. Yeah, like, you're why would you do it? Wait, you made a comedy album, and then you let Comedy Central fucking have it? Yeah. And what did they do? And I'm like, they just send me a check once in a while. And I was like, oh, that was very stupid. Didn't you have the ability to box it yourself? I was like, yeah, but I stopped doing that so they could put it in the box. And I was like, and like did they take all your money from you? Like, they did. Yeah, so yeah, they funny. actually fucking did. Right? It's like, you just see this whole new generation that are doing, but, but, but going with what you said, like, as much as there's a lot of, you know, crap on the internet bathroom wall, for stuff like this and for people that really like find great, um, community type of based content, whatever that might be, it is the best. Because now I get to fucking turn on something and I'm like halfway around the world learning about something in real time with people that are truly engaging and funny and sometimes a little fucking dark or whatever. Right. You're getting a little bit of everything. So that's why I, I, I'm psyched that you asked me to be on here because as I've watched more and I'm a fan, I'm seeing everybody in the timeline. I'm on the fucking TikTok and stuff too. I'm like, this is the most gratifying content to watch yeah. because it's funny. But every once in a while, you're like, I needed to hear that, yeah. you know? And so uh, for all those reasons, um, you've done a great job today. Thank you, and sir. thanks for coming on my show. Thank you very much for having right, me, Dan. I really appreciate it. See what it. I just did? Well, we sign off the show the same way. <laughs> the same way you look into that camera and you say one word or one phrase whenever you're ready. This will be embedded oh, in podcast shit. history. Okay. So when you're ready, uh, and, and I think we got a Smithsonian. Are we going to put this oh, in the Smithsonian? Isn't that what all we right. said? So at the end of every episode, one word or one phrase, it's your turn in that camera. Is this the end? Ready. Am I doing this? this is the, yes, oh, this fuck, is okay. the moment. You're, this is your shining moment. Okay. And I look and I just say one you word. Look, one word or one phrase. Or one phrase. It used to be a word and then more people were like, can I say a, a phrase or a limerick or a, yeah. Oh, but so, a limerick? Yeah. Some people go with a limerick? Buddy, we've fuck. had we've had spoken word. Uh, we've had... Uh, haiku? We've had haiku. Okay. We've had someone speak in tongues. So when you're free, you do it. Um, and you're oh, allowed fuck. to take a beat and think about it. I need to take a beat. Yeah, take a beat. Yeah, because there's a few. Take a beat. Are you on your phone? I'm gonna be on my no, phone no, too. No, 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 no. no. Um, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm writing down Dane took um, a beat. <laughs> um, uh, oh, fuck. That's okay. Let it rest for a second because that brain is spinning, baby. Okay. I'll I mean, get you off. You know it. what? I gotta probably do that thing where it's like, you gotta go with the first thing. You that, should. That popped in your. That was the whole point. And for whatever reason, something my dad used to say used to drive me crazy and now I find myself saying in the morning and I like to say to your your fans and friends that are that are watching today is the first day of the rest of your life in here we pour whisk 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 you were that creature in the ginger beard sturdy and ginger like vampires the ginger gene is a curse gingers are beautiful you owe me five dollars for the whiskey and seventy five dollars for the horse gingers are oh, hell no this whiskey is excellent I like gingers.